the reality is that the kids that, that are in our homes are not fluent in emotion. Emotion doesn't make sense. Their emotions aren't feeding them anything. And they really aren't that anxious to learn. Um, they're anxious for the emotions to go away. Welcome to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, a show about adoption, foster care, advocacy, and becoming the best caregiver possible. Pull up a chair. We're glad you've joined us. Here are your hosts, Mike and Kristen Berry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, or welcome back to the Honestly Adoption Podcast. If you are a regular listener, wherever you're joining us from, we're glad you're here. You're joining us for Season 28, Episode 256, and this is Part 2 of our End of the Year podcast series we launched last week called The Insight Archives. We are replaying the top four or four of the best sessions that we hosted from the 2021 and 2022 Insight Virtual Conference for free here on the podcast. But the great news is that when you're as a listener, you get special access to both the 2021 and the 2022 uh, Insight Virtual Conference replays for just $29.95 by visiting honestlyadoption.com slash insight. You can take advantage of that. That's happening now through the end of the year. And you get, gosh, um, I think 20 hours of training content, certificates uh, for your foster parent hours or for your home study hours. It is an exclusive opportunity that we are offering now through the end of the year. We've already had a great episode last week. We aired an episode that Kristen and I did talking about managing crisis and in this episode, we're sharing a session that our good friend Chuck Hagley from Project Patch did on navigating the online world with vulnerable children. It's a huge episode, awesome episode. You're going to love it. If you're brand new to the show, make sure you jump over to honestlyadoption.com slash podcast. You can learn all about what we do at the Honestly Adoption Company. Also, catch up on past episodes. And as I said a moment ago, don't forget... To take advantage of this special offer, both of the Insight Virtual Conference replays, 2021-2022, for just $29.95, $59.95 if you want lifetime access, visit honestlyadoption.com slash insight to learn all about that and take advantage of this special offer. We're glad you guys are here. We hope you enjoy this amazing conversation with Chuck Hagley. And now, on with the show. My good friend, Chuck Hagley from Project Patch. Um, he's going to be talking about navigating the online space with vulnerable children. And let me tell you about Chuck. Chuck has been the CEO of Project Patch since 2010. He has worked at Project Patch since 2003 in various positions, starting as a part-time chaplain, youth program administrator, and chief operations officer. He's been married to his wife, Kelly, since 1994, and they are the parents to two girls and a boy. He holds a Bachelor of Theology uh, in Theology with a minor in Psychology, followed by a Master's Degree in Business Administration. He is an ICF Certified Professional Coach. When not focused on being a dad or leading patch, he enjoys running, fly fishing, eating, reading. I, I enjoy eating too. Uh, eating, reading, and pursuing any other adventure he can find. My friends, welcome Chuck Hagley to Insight. Hello, my friend. Hey, it's great to be with you guys. Oh, man, it's great to have you here. I think I, I was reading that. I chuckled a little bit when it said eating, because I think eating. every time you and I are at conferences together, back when we used to go to in-person conferences, we would always carve out time to hit the restaurants and pubs because that's what you got to do, right? That's when the you're in best. A place that's like the Chicago, best. And that that's why best. you run. Yeah. That's why you do all that stuff so you can eat more. <laughs> exactly. Well, you run. I should. I probably <laughs> should start running more. So I'm, I'm motivated by you, my friend. Um, man, it's great to have you here. Um, and listen, you are my go-to expert when I when when we're talking uh, this crazy online world that we live in. Uh, and then you factor in children who have a trauma history, who cannot think logically or make logical choices. We know how that goes, right? Um, you've been on you you've uh, jumped into several of our one-on-one um, -on -one coaching calls that we do with with parents. Um, but I'm excited to have you here and talk about hey. this super important topic. And, well, uh, and I think the, yeah. the cool thing, Mike, is, is as adoptive dad, you know, we've been in this space of just holding space that it's hard. 
you know, and, and yeah. I love the fact that you're willing to hold that there aren't always easy answers, but we're willing to be in that space of, of trying to love on our kids in a really helpful way. So yeah, excited to be here. Yeah. And, and hopefully we can encourage people again with, with the fact that this tech world is here, but, but we're as parents can be stronger. Absolutely, man. Well, I'm going to let you jump on in. I know we, we're, we're going to try to carve out some Q&A at the end if we Perfect. can, um, but I'm going to go ahead and get your, your slides up here, turn my camera off and you take it away, my friend. Hey, all right. Hey, good to be with you guys. I wish I could see you all and that we could hang out face to face because it's so helpful on this topic sometimes just to see each other, um, to see the panic that, that that some of us feel when we when we look at at it's already hard and now it feels like technology is this constant, constant challenge. And so we're talking about vulnerable kids. We're talking about adoption foster. We're just talking about kids with trauma history. Um, a lot of challenges around this. And, and I don't know about you, but for a lot of us in the, in the world, we've, we want to protect our kids. We want to set up this, this environment that helps them. And we know that they're prone to get themselves into, into danger. We know that their impulses are there. We know that their appetites are there and that they're trying to get to something that we know will harm them. Maybe not, you know, immediately light them up on fire like knives and some of those kind of things. But it's the idea that, that our kids want to get something and we're trying to build up a wall. And our kids are climbing that wall and we're building that wall bigger. They're cutting the fence. Um, it's just this constant challenge. And so many of the parents that I speak to want to talk about wall building. And what I know is that at least that we can relate to is that, that there aren't walls that keep our kids. Um, our kids, if they want to see it, they'll see it. You know, and, and so, yeah, we want to protect them. We want to have this basics of, of safety. And I know some of you are, are at that point of like, you know, what is the basics? Um, there's a lot of resources out there from firewalls to, to resources for filters and some of those kind of things. Those are a foundation, but they aren't, aren't what we, what we need to focus on because honestly we, we build that basic wall, um, but our kids are climbers. Our kids are, are, digging underground. They're, they're getting their way through. Um, I think for a lot of us, it feels like this cat and mouse game with our kids. And there's certain kids that, that, that are in homes that if you put up a firewall, you put up a, a, a new device that's supposed to prevent them from going someplace, that's the challenge, you know, challenge accepted. I'm going to, that, that gets them even more fired up. Um, when I speak to youth, I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about, you know, the dark web or any of these kind of things, mostly because our kids know about it. And second, for some kids, that's just, uh, oh, cool you know, and, the, and they'll go home and try to hunt for some of this stuff. And so as parents, there's this, this idea that I want to keep my kids safe. And then a lot of the time we're like, what are they doing? You know, what are they doing on their device? Who are they texting? What websites are they going to? What are they doing on their social? And it feels like this cat and mouse game where we're just pursuing um, and one step behind, one step behind. Um, the other aspect of that is that our kids can be kind of wily, you know, in the sense they're hard to pin down. Um, with what they're doing online. We know that that a lot of our kids are drawn to pornography. A lot of them struggle with video game addiction. A lot of them are struggling with with boundaries when it comes to social media. Um, and and we know this, but at the same time, how is it playing out in their lives? Um, a lot of our kids are hiding from us. Um, you know, what what exactly is happening? They're really good at, at navigating the, that that space. So as parents, um, we're, we're worried. We're worried a lot of the time. And so my goal isn't to worry you guys. That's not that's not helpful. Um, I think <laughs> if you're like other parents, you're worried enough already. Um, you've got enough uh, enough things going on. And so part of the challenge that that I want to give you today is is you know given that these are the tendencies that we have as parents, that's natural for us to keep them safe. It's natural to pay attention to what our kids need to do. But there's going to come a point where even if we wanted to, um, we can't keep them safe. You know, when they're out of our care, um, when they become adulthood, you know, they reach adulthood. At that point, if they don't own that off switch, then they're at risk. And by off switch, I mean they own the ability to turn off the technology. They so when they use it, they can they can manage that. They can manage what they're seeing. And I will say that that I mean I <laughs> I hate admitting how old I am now. You can see the glasses. These weren't here like a couple of years ago. Um, now as a as a 50 year old guy, um, I still struggle with technology ownership. You know, I struggle with not only just technology ownership, certain apps get out of control at times in my life. And I've got a lot of emotional skills. I've got a lot of life experience. I've got perspective, relationships. I've got a lot that I've worked on and it's still a challenge. And so when you look at, at your kids that are struggling, you know, the, the fact is, is that you were asking them many times to do something that, that we struggle with ourselves. 
you know, that their peers struggle with, that our nation, that our, that our world struggles with is how do we own technology without it owning us? And that's the bigger challenge, you know, because, because end of the day, there'll be a time that we're done with fence building, that there's a time that we can't monitor them. And so our goal is how do we raise kids, especially these vulnerable kids that are really impulsive, that are drawn to some of the darkness, that are, are really struggling with, with emotions. How do we help those kids um, to navigate tech, to be able to own it? And, and if I had the right fast answer, <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be awesome. But it's, it's not in technology, it's in relationship. Our interaction with our kids, our ability to hold space, our ability to take time to teach, um, our ability to, to respond to the things that they're doing. All this stuff adds up in a way that it's like, how do I as a parent teach that teach that ownership? And that's that's the goal of our time together. Um, you know, you start looking at studies and, and one of the studies, um, it's not a new one, 2004, and I just found this framework helpful. It's, it's talking about emotional dysregulation and, and you can picture that, right? In <laughs> yourself as well as your kids, that moment of explosiveness. And emotional dysregulation doesn't necessarily mean to be the, the loud, you know, the, the screams, the yelling, the breaking, it also can be that dysregulation that turns inward. And so either one of those things is, is that dysregulated, is, is that messiness um, that's coming. And, and I'll give you the, the, the study words themselves, um, lack of awareness, understanding, acceptance of emotion. And so the fact is that there's big stuff happening and they just have no clue what's, what's going on. You know, they, they know something's up, but, but why and how and, and those kind of things is, is really a mystery. Inability to control the behaviors when they're experiencing emotional distress in the sense that it's a fuse that's lit. And before you know it, boom, you know, the, the explosion happens. Um, they know it's lit, but between knowing it's lit and, and when the explosiveness happens, they, they just don't know. There's times that, that kids describe they're in this this dysregulated state and they, they almost see themselves from from another perspective and it, and they can't stop it, you know, and, and a real desire to, to control it, but a, but inability to control it. And that scares a lot of kids, um, both for the strong positive emotions as well as the, the distressing ones. Um, lack of access to adaptive strategies to modulate duration. I love these big words. Um, to modulate duration or intensity um, of the adverse emotional experience. So they just lack tools to deal with it. It's not that it just explodes, but once it explodes, it seems like it just runs its own course and they can't do much about it. And then unwillingness to experience emotional distress as a part of pursuing meaningful life activities. Um, so in our terms, <laughs> I'll just make it a little more plain speak, um, they're not fluent in emotion. Um, and I think a number of speakers have, have talked about this already and that idea that, that it's, it's not even a second language, it's just not a language that they feel comfortable with. Um, for me, I'm, I'm, um, you know, if I go to another country, I might know how to say hello and thank you, um, but that's about it. When we adopted in China, you know, I, I knew the basics of <laughs> of Mandarin, and then we're in Cantonese China, and it was it wasn't worth much. Uh, but we know the basics, and and for most of, of us, adults included, know angry. We know um, sad. You know, that's pretty much where we're fluent in, and even those were not that fluent. And so the the reality is that the kids that that are in our homes are not fluent in emotion. Emotion doesn't make sense. Their emotions aren't feeding them anything, and they really aren't that anxious to learn. Um, they're anxious for the emotions to go away. Um, big emotions become uncontrollable behaviors. So that's that point number two is that you have a big emotion, boom. It's just these, these dominoes that, that fall in their life. And then the third is that it can't reduce the duration or intensity of the big feelings. And so even if they want to, it just seems like it has to run its course before they can, they can get to calm. And so they're looking sometimes for a way to, to control the stuff, but, but they don't lack the natural tools to do it. And then here's probably the, the bigger thing is that they avoid uncomfortable. You know, they don't want to be uncomfortable, um, even when it's necessary or helpful. There are certain tensions in our life. There are certain times that, that we need to feel uncomfortable, um, that relationships are built around that, that, that work ethic, that exercise. You know, there's a lot of good things that come from gaining that ability to be uncomfortable, not happy all the time, um, not in, in all that, that massive control all the time. So that's really what, what we're shooting for with this. For a kid that's dysregulated, you know, you think about what they're doing, and, and I like the idea of them juggling fire. 
You know, so when I'm talking to to a, a teen, when I'm seeing certain behaviors show up in their life, um, teen or, or a young kid, I'm thinking about all the stuff that they're juggling. You know, these things are in the air that are flying around them. They're flames flying around um, their emotions. There's relationships, there's circumstances, there's consequences, there's demands that are being put on them. Um, all these things are, are just flying. Some of the demands are social and friends. Some of it's the lack of something. So all this stuff is just just flying around them and they're just feeling really um, scared at that point. What's gonna happen if I don't catch it? What's gonna happen with these things that I'm, I'm juggling? Um, and so eventually that, that either something drops or these kids are in, are in a huge panic state. They're in these huge, huge emotion states. Um, they can't handle it, they can't handle it. And so they're at this, this point of juggling fire um, in ways that I don't think even as parents that are trying to understand our kids really well understand. And so, they're looking for solutions to make that easier. You know, they're trying to find a way to, to deal with life that it feels more secure, um, feels less dangerous, feels more in control. And so they're looking for help with this with this fire. Um, and so think about that in the, the, the mindset is that they're in a searching mindset for, for dealing with all this, all this craziness. And here's the other things that a lot of things that might not feel like a threat to us, to them feels very threatening. You know, we, we just don't perceive the world as quite the same challenge of us against them. Um, you know, we don't see, see the, the, the risks of, of relationship, of closeness, of vulnerability, as much as our kids would, would perceive those things as, as something that could burn and, and hurt them. Um, so just that, that mindset's even, even twisted around is that something that feels really safe and fun to us could seem really, really scary to them. Um, the other thing about it, you know, just really looking at that, that recipe for, for impulsivity is that mood, when mood drops and arousal goes up, <laughs> um, boom, you know, all sorts of impulsive stuff comes in. And so you can think of a typical, you know, bad mood, angry, um, I'm going to do something. And just that desire to, to get out of that state or to get into a new state is, is really, really strong. Um, that give up mindset, that, that impulsivity that I'm going to make a real good, real quick quick decision and, and real quick action. Um, good moods can actually affect that too, is that we have kids that are, you know, they're in that good mood and, and they're also impulsive there, is that their mood just being really strong um, creates all sorts of, of tension, you know, and, and you can think about it. You've had your kids on, on days that are, you think they have everything going for them, <laughs> um, you know, fun day with family, fun day with outings, um, but it could be really, um, it's too arousing to be in a, in a place like a Disneyland. It's too arousing to be around all these things, or there's a fear of letting your mood become too hopeful. And so there'll, there'll be times that, that tons of impulsive things come out. And so as a, as a parent, I think it's crazy because, because for us, we look at it impulsivity, but when you step back a little bit, realizing that these moods are, are these things that are going on in our kid's life, that their mood is going down, their arousal level um, goes up. Um, when you look at, at tech, it's interesting because, um, tech tends to move these pieces um, really, really well. You look at, at recent studies coming out of, of uh, Meta, I guess is what they call it now, but the Instagram study is looking at girls. Um, whether, and I know, I know um, Instagram um, argues about the, the validity of these studies, but I think it's pretty clear. They're saying about 20% of, of girls that are using it, it, it impacts their mood in a, in a pretty substantial way. So being on Instagram lowers their mood, anxiety, um, depression, social, um, social cues, their feelings about themselves, all those are, are brought down. So their mood, as they use these apps, are, are taken down. The interesting thing is that the arousal, you, you think about a kid that, that is the fear of missing out, the FOMO, or the arousal that comes from, oh, that's not fair, or I'm not invited, or I'm not included. Um, or that fact that I clicked on something and now I don't know if I said the right thing or I shouldn't have clicked on it or my friends aren't seeing me. Those sorts of things cause arousal. So think about it from that, that, that anxiety as well as feeling bad about themselves. That is a recipe for tons of impulsivity. So maybe if I just post this real quick picture, maybe if I do this TikTok, maybe if I, you know, and, and so they rush into that, that decision um, really, really quickly. The other thing is when you look at online pornography, um, that's raising arousal, sexual arousal in a real frustrating way. So as they start looking at videos, as they start going from site to site, um, the arousal goes up, their mood about themselves is actually dropping, and, and they continue to make more impulsive decisions. And so it's not surprising to me when you start looking at, at a porn history of a kid and say, you know, why in the world did you look at that? You know, that that shouldn't 
that doesn't make sense that you'd even be interested in that sort of thing. But the fact is, is that they were sexually aroused and their mood was down and they were highly impulsive as, as they did that. Um, highly impulsive. The types of things they, they say and, and do is, is, is um, it's hard for us to understand, but it's easier to understand from the lens of this activity that they're doing online is, is affecting this, their impulsivity. It's, it's a perfect recipe. It's a, it's a storm for that. Um, and at any given time, have you noticed our teens are juggling? They're standing between this this world in which there's lots of lots of information coming from them. Some of it's encouraging, and, and some of it's not. Um, which are they focused on at that moment? You know, they're they're going from side to side in their life, and they're really struggling with with where do I put? What do I believe? What do I give into? And um, it's interesting is that that our kids, especially kids that come from a vulnerability they tend to put more weight into the negativity rather than the positivity. And so you could give a lot of messages and one little, one little crack and, and boom, they, they're going down toward, toward believing, believing the, the darkest about themselves. I'm looking for, for evidence of that. Um, every kid struggles. I'll just say that with technology. And so a lot of the presentations I do aren't specifically for, for, for our kids. Um, but I think it's important for us to realize what is it that that's going on in their life that's causing them distress. You know, what are some of the big feelings they're going through? Um, loneliness, huge pandemic of loneliness. Adults, um, kids, right now we're living in a time in which people are highly lonely, highly disconnected. The interesting thing is when it comes to, to social especially is that they're looking for someone else to come in and solve that loneliness. You know, will someone reach out to me? Will someone connect with me? And having that phone and the ability for anyone to, to reach out to you and for it to be completely silent, um, for people to ghost you is just a terrifying, terrifying experience for our kids. And so high lo loneliness that they're experiencing with these high expectations that the next device or the next outfit or the next activity will solve it and still feeling, still feeling lonely. Um, anxious, you look at, at anxiety, um, continues to skyrocket. Um, times of change are difficult for everyone and just recognize right now we're in a time of additional change, you know, in our country going from, you know, masks to no masks, going from, um, you know, relatively peace now to, to the war that's going on. Um, there's a lot that our kids are, are really anxious about um, and adults. Um, depression, I think that's just really clear is that, that, that um, just the outlook, the um, whether it's a it's a chronic depression or something that's more of a situational, um, kids are experiencing that. A um, huge amount of insecurity, comparing themselves to to other people that are way more successful or way more active or way more, may, way more sought after. Those sorts of things um, get get our kids really, um, you know, feeling feeling bad about themselves. Um, you know, going on to frustrated just so frustrated. They're frustrated at themselves. They're frustrated at their parents. They're frustrated at the teachers. Just that feeling like, why does it have to be so crazy hard right now? You know, and, and I think that's just that that world that, that these kids are living in where it just feels like nothing's nothing's under control and, and things should go in a different way than, than they are. Um, pure boredom. <laughs> um, you think of, especially in the midst of COVID, boredom was this huge thing. And, and a lot of our kids are just feeling so lethargic, you know, they're just wanting some sort of jolt of energy or excitement in their life. Unloved. Um, yeah, that combination of feeling unloved and feeling unseen, you know, that, that combination that I'm invisible and I just want people to notice me, see me, um, care for me. And just that desperation for that, you know, is, is, is so many of our kids are feeling that. And, and what's, what's sad about that is a hard time accepting the love that they have, but it could be a total stranger and they feel love from that, or they feel connection from that, or, they, or tons of meaning making taken into, into a situation um, that's online, but, but not really feeling that in a, in a home environment where the, the, where the words and affirmation and care are there. And so really, really hard to break through that, 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 that thought, thought of, you know, no one sees me, no one loves me. Um, huge amount of entitlement um, that's running right now. And that really, I see it in a, in a sexual um, way is that there's a lot of teens that feel like they're entitled to a certain level of sexuality, sexual happiness. They're entitled to a certain amount of success and, and relationship um, where they haven't done anything to earn that relationship. They haven't given toward it. Um, they, haven't, they haven't contributed in a way that would grow a relationship, um, but they still feel like they should have that, you know, that that's owed to them um, just from, from the sense that they're, they're human beings, but entitlement's running so deep. And I'll say it runs in my life. You know, it's something that I constantly have to be aware of. 
um, shame. You know, the, the idea that we're talking here, um, when you look at Brene Brown's definitions and stuff, it's that idea of, of I'm bad. Um, guilt says I did something wrong, but shame says I'm bad. Um, we talked about pornography is that kids are on pornography and they keep looking at harder and harder core porn. And before you know it, they, they, they feel this, this incongruence or they feel the separation between who they think they are and what they have evidence of by, by what's turned them on. And there's a huge amount of shame, you know, about what they've seen. Um, struggling with, with what kind of person they are, putting labels on themselves. And then just people pleasing. Some of you are like, I'd be so happy if my, <laughs> if my kid would try to please me once in a while. But um, we see that people pleasing is a real poison, especially when it's someone that's out of the, that doesn't have their best interest in mind. And it seems like that's who our kids tend to try to please are the people that are, are most um, destructive toward them. And um, it seems like tech, tends to pull that out too is that is that they'll try to please a, a stranger they'll try to do something for a for um someone they've met online that that they wouldn't show that much care for the people that are that are close to them um perfectionism um, perfectionistic stuff um just that idea that i have to have it all perfect um just that fear um of of making mistakes that fear of of what people would think and so that drives a ton of 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 struggling and then just plain hopelessness. Uh, for Patch, our mission, if you look at, at the key of our youth mission is, is restoring hope to teens. You know, the fact is that if a teen is hopeless, um, it takes away the engine for life. Why would I go to school if, if I'm hopeless? Why would I try to be in a relationship if I'll never have one? You know, these sorts of things. Why would I even try for my parents if they're never happy? Um, so that hopelessness drives all sorts of, of negativity. And so you think about these massive feelings and our kids aren't feeling all of them, but my guess is that they're feeling some of these, you know, and these aren't comfortable places to be. You know, for, for most of us, we'd like that that way to get out of this as, as quickly as possible. I want to get to the I want to get to happy. I want to get to content or at least I want to drown out these these noises, these 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 voices. And so that's really that that push is how do I get out of this as, as fast as possible? And they might not even be verbally processing this, but if you look at their their behavior, their behavior is I want to escape to something good or I want to just numb out and, and forget this moment that I'm in. Um, or I want to find a shortcut for me to to get get what my heart desires. So I use this analogy. I, some of you, it might be hard to see what this is as a hammer and a, <laughs> trying to put screw into drywall. And I don't know about you guys. Um, I've done this. <laughs> um, the problem with this is that you can get the screw into the drywall pretty well. You know, you just give it a good thump and it goes in. But in that process, the drywall is compromised and, and it's less secure than it, than it needs to be. Most of our kids emotionally with their tools um, have this idea that I'm just going to use my strategy that's that's worked for me. And so, you know, whether it's an escaping strategy, whether it's a, a power strategy, whether it's it's some sort of um, just find a pleasure, you know, in an escape or, or control, or they've got some sort of strategy. And most of those strategies have, you know, especially around technology, is tech is their tool. It's their way that they found to deal with these big feelings. It's their way to deal with these uncomfortable situations, this awkwardness. And if I have my phone or if I have my computer, if I have my game, um, for that time, I feel okay. The problem is, is that it doesn't work. It, it actually creates a situation in which um, there's some damage done to relationships. There's some damage to, to themselves. Um, there's a loss of integrity that happens and there's a loss of security that happens. And so as you use the tool more, it actually doesn't work and it, and it, becomes, a, it becomes more fragile. Um, I want us to look at the pull of technology for our kids. Why is it that tech seems to be such an answer? Why is it that, that uh, for so many of our kids, their devices, their game is the, is the hope that they have? And so I want to break it down. I know these are hard to get into specific tech, but I, I want to give you guys some examples as, as we go through this. I wanted to jump in here real quick and tell you that, as I said in the beginning of this episode, we are offering a very special entrance deal to both the Insight Virtual Conference 2021 and 2022 replays. You can get both short-term replays for $29.95 or both replays lifetime access for $59.95. It's a special deal that we're offering just to our podcast listening audience. To take advantage of this, jump over to honestlyadoption.com slash insight 
and you can op- get access today. And this offer is only good until the stri- stroke of midnight on January 1st into the new year. So don't miss your opportunity to get access to both replay libraries from Insight Virtual Conference 2021 and 2022. And now back to the show. There's a huge pull about being self-reliant, um, especially for kids that have been harmed, um, been through trauma, been, been um, there's a helplessness, but there's also this idea that I don't want to depend on, on anyone else. I don't need anyone and I don't want anyone. I want to be this, this by myself and, and life will be best if I don't, if I don't allow anyone into that. And so the huge amount of self-reliance, I mean, when I look at this, this picture here of this little girl with her, with her pacifier is that um, there's some sort of separation. There's some sort of fear going on. And that pacifier is what she's depending on at that moment to hold it together, you know, and that pacifier is not going to do much if, if that makes any sense. But I see nowadays where tech, especially grabbing a phone is that moment of, of just, I'm okay. Now I've got my phone, you know, the panic goes away. Um, Pornography is, is sex by yourself. You know, I'm best if I if I can just have sex and have all the satisfaction of sex without me having to depend on on anyone else because other people are scary. I'm letting my needs be known to other people scary because they can say no or they can use it against me. Um, if I depend on someone else, that's setting up an expectation that I'm I'm afraid to to do. And so, um, when you look at tech, so much of the tech is that I am in control and I'm, I'm self reliant. I I don't need anyone else. Um, there's a huge element of control that you can get on online. Um, Using a device, you've got just command of that device. Um, For kids that are are using video games and they just click, 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 and they navigate a really, they they move their character through through a sequence. That feels great. You know, there's just a huge amount of control in in video games. You can make the character do what you want. You can do, you can can manipulate things in in a way that, that feels really, really good. And and that feels that feels great to people. Huge amount of control in video games. There's a huge amount of control in pornography. I can make people take off their clothes. I can make people, and in the brain is doing all sorts of weird um, countertransference. But it's this idea that that I can, I can um, even degrade people. We'll talk about that power differential a little bit. But it's that that idea that I'm in I'm in control in this situation. I can make people do what I want. Um, I'm strong. There's a huge amount of predictable experience when you go onto onto a computer, when you when you use a phone, when you use video games, pornography, whatever it is, um, social media, YouTube, that experience kids can count on that that even though maybe the content they're doing is a little different, they can count on it meeting their needs or taking up some of their time or doing doing something in their life. It's just a predictable experience. And for kids that feel really unpredictable that their life is kind of um, in shambles, you know, it's that idea that I can know what's going to happen when it's going to happen and i feel like this is my this is my safe place um school home life relationships all those are really unpredictable but but especially tech is is hyper predictable um yeah it's just designed that way um low vulnerability online online requires um you can disclose what you want to disclose um you can try to be the person that you want to be especially around strangers um it's it's that idea that I just share what what I want to share, but I can hide hide the real me. I can appear as happy, I can appear as confident, I can appear as popular. I can do all these things. You don't have to know that inside of me, I'm I'm really struggling. I'm just barely holding it together. And so that idea that 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 I'm in control, I play a character. Um, it's almost like an avatar. This is what I want to look like, and I I base my avatar um, as 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 a projection of of what I want to be, not necessarily of what I am. And so there's just a huge amount of, of interesting vulnerability. Um, I'll talk a little bit more because especially on chat and some of these kind of things, um, there's a almost a fake vulnerability that we share a lot, um, but there's a lot of times that we withhold hold certain parts of that. Um, huge amount of power. You can do amazing things. Um, my daughter and I like to skateboard, and I will say that I'm much better at skateboarding on Tony Hawk's game. <laughs> than I am at the skate park, especially when it, when I fall and hurt, you can do tricks. You can run, you can slam dunk. You have power in these games to do things that you physically can't do. Um, when you're controlling a video game, like I said earlier, there's just amount of control, but you can also blast things. Um, we talked about porn and, and there's a, a dark side of porn 
that that is um, around rape porn is is a huge um, scary scary area of porn and and the power the misogynistic stuff that happens around porn is is so much times around around power um, that dynamic a lot of times we're thinking that kids are going back to porn um, because of of um, being horny or being sexually um, charged um, especially for our kids that have had um, trauma around sexuality done to them. A lot of times it's replaying that situation in ways that either transfers a, a sense of decision-making to them where they didn't have it in the past or gives them a sense of power in the situation, either because of a choice or because of exerting that on, on someone else. And so porn um, is really revealing. So many times we just assume that we know why they're looking, but, but especially around the darker side of power and, and porn dynamics, there's a lot of there's a lot of insight there. Um, and then social media, just that desire that I want to be an influencer. I want to be a YouTube star. I want people to follow me when I play my video games. I want them to watch it. There's this huge idea that, that if I have a following, um, then my life matters. You know, and there's a huge dynamic of, of power that comes with that. And then that idea that I control the story. I, I share a narrative. I've got, I'm performing for my life. Uh, we talked about a little bit is that on, online chats, um, you can get empathy, you can get people to feedback to you because you tell them what what you you want to tell them. You don't tell them anything that would cause accountability. And so if they're going to be sharing online or on a video or on a chat or on a on the TikTok about how unfair their parents are, they'll craft that story in a way that that just captures the bad stuff but doesn't capture the the other stuff they, they control the storyline they control the amount of vulnerability and the, and the narrative that they that they share and so all of that goes together to be this this idea that they're living a front stage life when in the reality in the backstage life all those things are happening boredom loneliness insecurity jealousy um all the big feelings, all the big feelings that remember from the start of our discussion is that that they don't know what to do with these big feelings. These big feelings can affect mood, they affect arousal, and before boom, they're being impulsive. They're going places online, they're, they're doing stuff with devices, um, they're sharing st content online, um, they're making connections online that, that, that they wouldn't do if they're in their calmness, but they seem like the, the best answer at that, at that moment. Um, the final couple ones I think are really interesting is that that tech is super distracting. You know, they distract not only from the duties you have to do, but from the things that are going on in the mind. Is that a kid can play a video game and lose track of hours of time. You can binge on Netflix, you can binge on, on YouTube, and it's just like, I don't have to think for this time. And for kids that are just really anxious, overthinking things, um, inundated with thoughts, that just seems like the perfect, perfect vacation. And then the predictable chemical happiness is that the reality is that these experiences provide some sort of, of um, response, it, some sort of trigger in the brain in a way that's, that's really predictable. And I'm not, um, there's a lot of discussion about this. I'm not going to go into super deep. There's a lot of more experienced people about it. Um, serotonin, mood stabilizers, dopamine, oxyco oxytocin, um, endorphins, all these things um, are, are things that the kids know that, they, that that makes them feel better. And so ways of triggering their brain to do it, to, prov to provide that. And so whether it's a, a video game, whether it's a like, whether it's a connection that comes in, whether it's the person pursuing them online, all of these things are releasing brain chemicals in a really predictable way. Um, that people notice me, they want me, boom things are happening. There's a reward system that goes in. There's a mood stabilization. There's a bonding. Um, it could even be a fake bonding, but it just, boom, it, it hits them so fast. And so this chemical happiness, we have chemicals that release in, in everyday relationships, but they're less predictable. They're less controllable. And so tech provides a really quick way, a predictable way, like we talked earlier, of, of releasing these things. And so it's it makes sense. You know, it makes sense that, that they use tech um, the way they do, that it, it makes sense that they depend on tech. It makes sense that, that they're drawn to some of the dark sides of tech. And for us, we look at it as, you know, technology is, is their problem. You know, their life would be, would be better without tech. For them, technology is their solution. You know, it's their way of coping. It's their way of dealing with the big feelings. It's their way of dealing with the relationship tensions, with the awkwardness, with the insecurity. It's, it's their solution. The problem with it, even though it's their solution, it it's not, it doesn't solve their puzzle. You know, it's just not meeting the need that they're they're hoping to meet. Um, 
they're feeling continued anxiety. When you look at the, the studies that have to do with, with um, tech use from, from iGen with, with some of the, the, the book iGen talks about this generation and the, the longitudinal studies, you look at using tech for about an hour a day might decrease some anxiety, depression. Past that hour, there's this huge hockey stick where, where suddenly they're feeling more depressive, more anxious, more frustrated. And so for them, they're using this tech, it brings maybe short-term relief and then whoop, it, it doesn't work for them. It leaves them feeling, feeling worse. I'm going on to social media and, um, oh, wow, some people liked my post. You see those right away. You see some likes. And before you know it, um, you're looking at other people's stuff and noticing that they've got more more response rate or they have a nicer dress or they're prettier or they're they're smarter or they're doing something something else. And so as a parent, you know, we're, we're looking at, at so much of our focus is on the tech where really, as, as I share with you guys, and this is a way harder place to be in, is is really what's that hole? You know, what is it that they're, what is it they're that they're longing for? Um, what is it that they might not even be able to express? And how do I help them meet it appropriately? How do I help them walk into that space so that that they do have the fullness and completeness that they're longing for, given that they're from a point of vulnerability that they they might not even have the language around around tech. Remember that first point that we did: lack of awareness, understanding. You know, that idea that they're not fluent in emotion. That emotion doesn't make sense. Um, to me, when you're looking at tech, so many people, once again, are looking at firewalls and some of these things. To me, that emotional support for the kids, helping them get to that point of understanding, what is it that you're feeling right now? What's the best way to meet it? Um, it's afternoon right now in Portland, Oregon, where I'm <laughs> speaking from. Um, yeah, my sorry, my watch just spoke to me. Um, I tend to, my answer in the afternoon is that I need sweets. I don't know about you, but chocolate, um, you know, some sort of energy drink, like, I guess I don't do energy, but coffee. <laughs> um, I'm looking for that, that I need candy bars. You know, I need donuts. I need that. Um, but the reality is most of my time in the afternoons, what I most benefit from is, you know, drinking some water, um, getting some exercise, getting some motion, getting some fresh air. And that'll actually satisfy that, that brain thing. If I eat candy, if I, if I, you know, do those sorts of things, I'm going to still feel that feel that need. And as an adult, I don't know about you guys, but you know, am I hungry? Or am I thirsty? <laughs> am I um, tired right now and need a nap? Or am I tired and need to move? You know, those things are, are you think they'd be simple, um, but we don't have it dialed down. You know, am I angry right now? Or am I embarrassed? Am I anxious? Or am I, you know, and, and getting to the point that, that our kids can understand what is it that my body's telling me? What is it that I'm physically sensing? And so that mindfulness, that awareness is, is a really key piece for us. And so our youth program highly focuses on, on this idea of that emotion regulation piece from understanding what I'm feeling. I'm teaching the language around it. Um, you guys have charts. You have different ways of doing it. I use an app on my phone um, that really helps me understand where I'm at emotionally and where I want to go. Um, it, I think it's called the mood something or other. Um, but having that richness of, of language, comfortable, I have emotions, you have emotions. Um, some of the emotions are, are ones that we want to push away from us naturally. That doesn't mean we should push them away, but that's the impulse that your brain is going to have. Some we're going to pull toward us, and that might be good in the moment, but not might not be the best thing. But just all these things that are happening on with, with emotion and emotional language, modeling it um, is, is a really big part of our lives, You know, being able to share that. Um, share that time. And that's really verbal, um, but it's also that awareness of where am I, where am I feeling it? Um, a lot of our kids are having stomach aches or having diarrhea. That's that anxiousness in their body. You know, the tension in the shoulders, the, the excitement in the hands, you know, the, the dartingness of, of things. And so we can teach the emotions um, in a way that, that really helps them out because that's, that's really, that's really the key is, is being emotionally aware of what's happening. Um, because for so many times, if we're not emotionally aware, if we don't have language for it, if we don't even understand the need, we end up trying to meet it in a, in a superficial or, or not helpful, not helpful way. Um, second thing is inability to control behaviors. So big emotions, boom, you know, become uncontrollable, uncontrollable behaviors. It's that idea that I have license to, you know, out anything that I want because I'm, I'm angry. Um, so that distress tolerance um, piece, ability to feel big things, but, but be able to, to manage it. Um, that, that there is a way to slow that, that process down. Um, when it comes to tech, you know, that uh, ability for us is that um, when emotions are going to be really, really high or when your impulsivity is, is low, um, 
having times that you're less likely to be able to do a lot of damage. A lot of times, even even my kids get really frustrated because we have this idea that that with their phones, with their technology, stuff goes um, off at nine. Um, it's in our room. It's it's they don't have access to their to their phones at night. Um, that's not necessarily distrust, but it's just a realization that us as human beings. Um, can be more emotional or we can be more impulsive at certain times of day, certain times of night with sleeplessness with some of these things. And so when I am going to be that way, I'm going to take away some of my tools to harm relationships in myself. That's really that, that way of, of starting to counter it. And so a lot of times we're looking at, you know, how can I make sure that, that when we're most vulnerable, we don't have the tools to, to be most destructive. And when it comes to tech, that's just kind of, you know, knowing how to turn it off, um, knowing how to set it down, um, Knowing that when I'm feeling certain ways, I want to post things that might not be as appropriate. Um, I might respond to other people's posts in ways that are, are relationship damaging. And so getting that awareness of the fact that I can control myself, I can pull back from, from some of this stuff. Um, number three, we talked about this idea that we can't reduce the duration or intensity of big feelings, that our kids really get these big feelings and they can't they can't seem to manage them. And, and there's so many tools that, that I've heard, you know, as, as we've talked about that, and it's really that skillful use of tools is it, you know, when you're feeling lonely, what do you do when you're feeling anxious? What's, what's a tool you can use. Um, and that tool just kind of helps us process it, gives us some control and management of it, and then just kind of helps us, helps us shape that, that moment is something that, that could be helpful. So lonely, you know, we should feel lonely sometimes because there's just an awkwardness about that. Rather than waiting for someone else to solve it, my tool for loneliness is going to be um, reach out to a friend. It could be um, go do a, a something nice for a neighbor. It could be all there's there's tools that I can use use in that moment. And a lot of times, kids resort to helplessness. You know, and, and that's really not helpful. Um, remember that that logic isn't really flowing at that point. And so we really do see that 10 seconds. If you can buy 10 seconds with almost any kid. Um, good stuff can happen. That's the time of three deep breaths. And I don't know about you, but I can do stupid in less than one breath. You know, so if we can get to the three deep breaths, you know, three full breaths together, um, so much of the time that that really gets to the time that that, that you're much more much more integrated and, and able to respond rather than than react. Um, but yeah, time is on our favor. But for our kids, a lot of times they don't feel feel there's there's enough time. They just go straight to explosiveness. So we're trying to slow that process down, um, get them from that that explosiveness to the to the calming. And so really that that really has to do with tech use in the sense of what are they doing with their tech? Um, is their tech increasing that 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 focus, that breathing, that awareness. And, and most of the time it's, it's not. I've talked to a lot of kids that have destroyed a lot of stuff in their, in their house, you know, game raging. Um, and then, <laughs> and then they wake up and it's like, that was a bad choice. You know, they're smash the TV to, to break their controller, throw the keyboards, that sort of stuff. And so how is it that when you lose, how is it that when you feel angry that you can get to that calm? Because I'd like you to be able to play that game without you destroying your stuff. You know, I'd really like you to be able to to enjoy your time online without without having to rebuy buy this equipment that that you you already paid for, and so skillful use of tools. You know, helping them see what's the problem. You know, that emotional intelligence piece we we talked about a couple steps ago. You know, the question that we're going to get to in the next thing is, does it need fixed? Because there's certain things that are going to be painful in the short term. That's okay, and then there's certain things that have a long term benefit. So, is this need fixed in the short term, or is it long term? Our kids all feel that intensity for now, 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 and we're trying to get them to to expand that. Um, what can I fix? You know, you can't fix your school problems. You can't fix your your whole situations, but giving them some, you know, the fancy of locus control is that they feel like they have a lack of control. And so what can we, where can we provide control for them? Um, and that's a tough one, you know, because so many of our kids will take whatever control we give them and smash it into some sort of, they'll, they'll weaponize it. And so what we want to do is find ways that they can find some control, some ways of, of dealing with stuff and that's that's really what we're looking for is, is other ways of, of experiencing this this control in positive ways. And then what tools do I need? You know, identify skills and then recognize that if you give a kid a screwdriver and they've been used to using a hammer, they might not have the skill set for it. And they might be quickly to go back to the tool that they're more comfortable with. And so realize that, hey, this is going to take practice for you um, to get comfortable with this. Um, you know, for you to, to set the phone down and do something else or for you to do another activity is going to be be really uncomfortable for a while. And so it's going to take practice. It's going to take time. Um, one of the tools that we use for kids, especially around video games, and I think it's probably a good use for almost all of our 
of our entertainment. Um, how long am I going to play? You know, before they start playing, is that you know I want you to have fun. I'm I'm really wanting the best for you for this. You're going to play for a little while. How long are you going to play? You know, thirty minutes, forty five minutes, an hour, or whatever the kid is is allotted or what they choose. Um, and then how do you hope to feel when you're done? You know, what what's the feeling that you're hoping for? You're hoping to feel um, accomplished, content happy, you know, try to get some emotional language out there. This is, I'm feeling tense right now. And I hope to feel, you know, an hour from now that I, I feel just kind of more in control of myself or, or, or whatever they're, they're shooting for. And then, you know, after that time is done, how long did you actually play and how do you actually feel? You know, for young kids, this is going to be, you know, some monitoring, but to me, this, this question is, do you play, you know, did you have the ability to stop when, when you, planned on stopping and then did it did it do what you wanted to do and, and really get to that question that you know would something else have been worked better you know is there anything else that i could have done that would have either kept me in the time frame that i wanted or more importantly given me that satisfaction that i was looking for that that feeling i was hoping for um, because if something's not working let's let's find a tool that that'll help you that I, i'm on your side i want you to feel these things and so let's let's work on that together um, and then number four is just avoid um, being uncomfortable, even when it's necessary or helpful. Um, regular life is uncomfortable. You know, there's there's so much that our kids are uncomfortable dealing with these situations that maybe a lot of other of us take for granted, uh, but they just don't want to go there. They just don't want to go there because it's so, so awkward. And so finding ways that we can enter into safety with them in these situations of life that that they really need to get get comfortable with. You know, they need to get comfortable with putting that phone down, you know, walking away and, and being in a relationship, realizing that when we're together, we set the phone down. Even when it's beeping alerts to us, we keep the phone down. For a lot of kids, that's really uncomfortable. Their singular is going to act up, their, their impulsiveness, the stories they're going to tell themselves is that they're missing out on everything good that's happening right now. Um, but being able to be present um, is is really uncomfortable, but it's it's a skill, skill they need to do. I'm um, talking it out. You know, most of our kids are really uncomfortable with, with the verbal side of it. We really do recommend, rather than like this picture has, is just a, a nosy mom is just walking together, getting on a, on a walk, getting away from some of the, the disturbances around the house. Um, hey, let's just walk around the block a couple times, or let's go to the, the park and just, just walk. Um, maybe not even have to talk it out, take the dog on the walk. And after a while, you'll find that that a lot of times um, conversations start and, and it's easier for them to do it. Um, a lot of times the face-to-face -face with our kids that have gone through vulnerability is just really uncomfortable. And so doing shoulder to shoulder where you're less intense um, is, is really helpful. Um, protect sleep. Um, so many of our kids are at that point with sleep is, is a real issue. Um, stupid comes out at night, so we wanna, we wanna work with that. But it's also that idea that if they lack sleep, um, they'll really struggle. And so a lot of times there's a lot of kids doing a lot of activity at night. And so our kids wanna have their phones. Um, don't let them have their phones in the room. Um, it just isn't isn't helpful. And I know some of you have battled over this. It's a battle worth worth pushing. Um, exercise and even teamwork. I know not every kid's an athlete, but all of us benefit from from movement, um, fresh air, um, getting out there. That sense of belonging that can happen on a team that's that's coached well um, can be really, really helpful. It's an analog version of of accomplishment, of of real gameplay that that can be really helpful. Um, that practice being a beginner. Is, is really helpful for us as parents modeling being a beginner. I've had a lot of fun with skateboarding with my kids, even though I did it as a teen, it's been really fun to get out to the skate parks together again. We do it early in the morning because it's embarrassing for me to do it when all the kids and their friends are there. Um, but you know, just learning, being learners together, practicing something, taking up a hobby, taking up an instrument. So we model it. The best times are, are just getting them comfortable with the tension of I'm not perfect at something and I'm, I'm learning it real good analog stuff. And then for us as parents, you know, just really demonstrating accountability in our lives um, between spouses in work, in our computer use that, that we're not hiding. And then just really helping the kids understand that accountability is, um, one of those things that really does help us help us thrive. And so, you know, being able to, to touch their phone without them freaking out, that might be a first step. Um, but in our family, we don't do secrets online. We don't hide stuff. You know, those are, are things that we really work hard on, on doing. And, and the reason for that is that I make better choices when I don't think I'm, I'm working in secrecy. Um, secrets tend to bring out some of the, the shady side of us. And so having a lot of good, good teachings around secrecy is important. Um, you know, just the, the, the push that, that so many of us have and our kids have is that, you know, we're here trying to ruin their life. 
that we're trying to take away something that 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 they have. And so imagine looking down at a screen right now, standing on this rock in this beautiful way. But if you took the screen out, take a big breath and see the beauty that's around you, you'd realize that it's like, I'm surrounded by really great opportunities. I'm surrounded by beautiful things that that bring way more richness to life. Um, so when I'm working with with kids, I can I know why they want the screen. I know why it's it's the solution for them. But but as I enter this dialogue, it's not that I want to take away from them. I want to give them perspective and view. I want to give them give them a chance to be in deep relationship, to feel true belonging, you know, to find the freedom that they long for, the, the purpose they long for, the meaning that they long for. And so I know that sounds really kind of mushy. Um, but to me, that's 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 what we're shooting for. It's not that we're trying to take away tech. We want our kids to live in a world of tech and and thrive, realizing that even though they have their vulnerabilities, um, especially because of vulnerabilities, their life so much so many times is is smaller than it than it needs to be. And so that's that's my my sharing with you guys. Um, I know this is frustrating. There's a lot more resources than this. Uh, we've got a 12 part parent series on on tech, um, hours of content that that we provide into specifics. Um, so if that's ever a resource that you guys are interested, in, just reach out to Project Patch and you'll, you'll see um, some of those resources. Um, but, you know, end of the day, guys, this is not an easy thing. You know, if anyone tells you it's easy <laughs> or that a device will conquer it, it doesn't. It's relationship. It's perspective. It's, it's pursuing our kids' hearts. It's teaching. Um, it just happens to be that tech is, is one of the hardest, most explosive things that, that is in each of our homes. And so we all, we all struggle with it. And so, um, Mike, I, I'd love to open it up for questions. I know there's there's probably more. I've seen a lot of dialogue, um, but yeah, let's let's yeah, take it yeah. if you want to if you want to lead that. Yeah, sure. Um, the 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 one question that I saw come in, um, and let me go ahead and uh, I'll leave your uh, your slide up there um, while we do oh, this. But oh, okay. um, yeah, let, here's one question that came in uh, a while early on in your presentation. Um, talking about some of the strategies you were sharing. Do these strategies work for tweens as well? Yeah. Um, my argument always is start young. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you can start really young, you're, you're, I think all of us benefit from time, but, but for tweens, yeah, definitely. I think with tweens, um, I love tweens. I mean, I'll just say that we work, our, our program's licensed 12 through turning 18. Um, these are young kids, you know, they're looking at, at so many dynamics is happening in life, everything from puberty to, to, to budding sexuality, to relationship drama. Um, and so all these things are happening. I say one caveat for, for some of you that are here, I know there's, and, and I was that, that parent, my kids just got phones at 13, um, younger than that. Most of their friends had phones and they didn't understand that that's hard on them. It, it, could be the very best decision you're making, but if you don't have empathy for like, it's really uncomfortable to be with a bunch of kids that don't have, that everyone has a phone and you don't, everyone's watched a show and you haven't, everyone's on an app and you, you're not there. That's a hard place for kids to be. And yeah. we need you to be there right now. <laughs> you know, so at least having the empathy, maybe you won't change your, your policy, but but it's important. Um, for for those kids that are, are um, how would you describe it? What, what I really focus on for the for the kids that are, are preteens you know, the younger is, is really the, the smart, dumb phone. Um, having a phone with a lot of accountability in which you can manage taking apps on and off so you can manage screen time, the amount of time that they're doing. So as they show responsibility, you can grow their their freedom. As they yeah. play yeah. cat and mouse, you can shrink their freedom. You know, so yeah. really tactile. Yeah. Um, you're not the jerk. It's just like if the phone doesn't come in at this point, this is what happens. You know, just yeah. cause and effect in, in ways. And so that's that's part of the push with with kids with with that. Um, a lot of parents want to buy these little phones that are like safe phones. Um, that's super embarrassing for our kids. They they'll forget that phone. They'll hide that phone. So what we say is yeah. invest in a decent phone with lots of controls. Um, we use the Apple yeah. device because that the screen time and some of that stuff is, is pretty effective. Yeah, um, not perfect, but pretty yeah. effective. Yeah. yeah, we actually um, and 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 lately too, and the recent, the most recent iOS updates, the parental controls have become much better on mm -hmm. iPhones. We actually uh, over in the virtual lobby, um, we are we have a little. Uh, if you scroll down to our partners uh, or our special guests, you're going to see a uh, uh, an icon for Gab Wireless. Um, it's actually a, a a partnership that we're in with Gab Wireless. And the cool thing about it, you mentioned Chuck, like phones that that just don't look cool you know mm -hmm. 
thing about the Gab Wireless is the Gab Wireless um, actually d- looks like a regular phone. It looks and that's like perfect. a if, uh, yeah. yeah. And so that's, that's, that's the perfect. reason why. Yeah. yeah. And those yeah. are super effective with the younger, you know, how many people can you control that they reach out to? That's a really good yep. solution. And for our kids that are really hyper impulsive, they're going to need that. They're going to need that. Yes. Um, yes. But yeah, I think I think that's where the where I'm pushing for is more the empathy, understanding what does it feel like for mm-hmm. a kid to be in a social situation with a tool that a lot of judgment goes into, you know, or yeah. to be treated like a baby is is really uncomfortable for our kids. And so that's the kind of empathy that I, I'd like us as parents to think about, not only the decisions, but how does it feel for that kid to walk it out in school? Right, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think that that's something that parents need to be tuned into for sure. Um, but yeah, over in, over in the virtual lobby, um, you can click on that, uh, that, that link and check out Gab Wireless, um, and see what, see, see how that could, could benefit your family. We actually are, are using it with one of our kids and it's actually a really effective device. And again, he, uh, this child is, is in high school. This phone is not embarrassing. Um, nobody knows, nobody knows what kind of phone it is. Um, so it does actually work really well. And I see that Bethany pointed out empathy is such a good point. Yeah. The huge point. Um, uh, he, a very, very good point, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's all the questions. <laughs> yeah. We have. Well, and that's that's interesting that you say, and, and this is a challenge is that um, high school kid, another kid, you can have multiple kids in your house that have multiple levels of maturity and, and ownership. You, you know what I mean? And most of the kids think that's not fair because I don't have what this person has. You know, and part of what we want to break down to is that. Um, <laughs> does everyone get to drive a car? If you're not showing the skills, the, the awareness, all these things, I'm not going to put a car in your hands. <laughs> you know? Absolutely, I might yeah. have a skateboard or a bike <laughs> in your hands at this level of, of responsibility that you're showing. Um, so it's not yeah. necessarily that we're creating an unfair world, but we do have to realize that, that not each one of our kids are at that same level of tech ownership. You know, the devices that we're choosing for them, the hours that they can use it, our kids are going to hate it because they want predictable, same, um, that's not in their best interest. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. I'm seeing a couple of questions here. Uh, um, Kit, kiddo can, can turn off parental controls. We understand that. I think that's the reason, one of the big reasons why we are, we are promoters of gab wireless is because they, they cannot do that with gab, with the gab wireless phone. Um, So I will say the majority, uh, the majority of our teens, the majority of our teens that struggle with tech addiction in our programs had a device that their parents didn't know about had Mm. access to a network that wasn't their own yeah um and so i i do believe that device management is key it's just heartbreaking that we can't we just can't i think it's reasonable to look at at our kids using the phone that we gave them are they online you know if there's gaps in their usage that's a pretty good idea that they're using someone else's phone yeah. You know, if, yeah. if you're there in their room on a device and you know, oh, they should be texting their friends, yeah. but you see no internet traffic going by on your router, yeah. that's a good sign that they're using someone else's Kristen's phone. Kristen's off camera right now, um, but she's, she made a good point. The school device, um, yeah. that's been a huge Our problem. Kids didn't even need a phone. Yeah. yeah. Didn't even need, all of a sudden we, we discovered a whole other world. Uh, what was it just, just right beneath the surface. You know, yeah. so that's a huge, that's also a huge yeah. issue. Yeah. And different school yeah. districts have way different skills on how they manage their kids tech. I'll just say that how safe kids yeah. are is really don't assume that it's don't assume they're doing their job. Well, yeah. Um, this question just came in. Are you saying we give it or they will find one? No, we're saying they're going to find one. Uh, I, I think that we try to, yeah, I, to me that the, if they have a device and we have accountability built in, we're going to see a, we're going to see their tracks. We're going to see, you know, through a screen time, you're going to see their activity that they're doing. They're going to leave a digital footprint that you expect a teen to leave. Yeah. Um, and so if they have a device and they're leaving no footprint, that's the sign that they might be circumventing. And that's mm-hmm. important to know, you know, so we're not trying to trick them into finding a phone. Although we've, I've encountered a lot of teens in which another parent will give them a phone because they feel sorry for them. Hide this yeah. from your parent. Um, yeah. We can't control that, but part of it is I'd like to, the smart dumb phone to me is, is a really healthy process to be in with, with kids at a certain level. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My friend, uh, as with everybody who's been on the broadcast today, I wish we could just keep talking because hey. um, your, what your wisdom is beyond um, measure, man. It's just amazing. And um, the, I love that you focus on the heart. 
I think that's the most valuable thing since mm-hmm. the first time I heard you speak years ago on this topic. Um, the, the fact that you're like, man, let's just, let's, we're not going to just talk about like, you know, uh, safety, uh, programs or platforms we can, uh, or parental controls. We're going to talk about the heart yeah. and, you know, getting to the heart of the matter. So I really appreciate that about you and, uh, just your, your perspective. Thanks for being on here. Hey, glad to do it. Blessings to you guys. Yeah. Yes. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you much. Thank you much. Thank you for listening to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, a resource courtesy of the Honestly Adoption Company. To learn more about us, visit www.honestlyadoption.com.